give brand new translations of the scriptures. Um, I want to just, get, it's, it's a little bit difficult in this context um, under these circumstances to go through and show you just sort of how that scholarship works, but I'd be remiss if I didn't focus on, um, on at least a couple of examples to give you an idea of, 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 of why moving along into new translations is of benefit and understanding sort of the, the, the issues that go along here. And I, I just, I'll explain these after we look at them, but Here's, two pass here's the same passage in two translations. This is from Acts 8, um, verses 36 through verse 38. Or rather, verse 30, yeah, verse 36 through 38. And you might notice that the King James Version is a tad bit longer. In the New International Version, um, there's the, if you, look at, if you look in your New International Version Bibles, it says, uh, the eunuch says, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And then apparently verse 37 is a pregnant pause. And then verse 38 says, and he gave orders to stop the chariot. And they both, Philip and the eunuch, got out and went down into the water. But if you look in the King James Version of the Bible, sure enough, there's your verse 37. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so they go down into the water and the eunuch is baptized. Now, why would the New International Version come along and excise such an important passage that testifies to the significance of Christian baptism? Clearly, this is evidence that the, the, the newcomers in the block are undermining the orthodoxy of the scriptures. Unless, of course, we look at the underlying Greek text and um, again, this has been talked about through the series, and I'd be glad to talk about it afterwards, but the underlying Greek text called the Textus Receptus that informs the King James Version is, is, um, is a great, uh, it's, it's, a, it's the state-of-the-art text in the 15th and 16th century, but, it's, um, but by today's standards, we know a lot more. We have access to a lot more ancient Greek text and earlier Greek text, and so we have a lot better way of assessing the reliability and the nature of that Greek text. So this is actually the manuscript, the culprit. If we go back here, the, the missing line, verse 37, this is the culprit from uh, which caused this problem um, uh, pretty much. This is the earliest uh, uh, version of our earliest copy of the book of Acts that has this insertion. And what I've done is this is from... Um, uh, Metzger's book on um, the textual criticism of the New Testament, what I've done is I've taken the, um, the, the bottom line and it explains that this is called Codex Ladianus and um, uh, 35. And if you notice, in the parentheses, it says it's the 6th of the 7th century. We have a number of earlier texts, papyri, um, uh, uh, copies, you may have heard of Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, that have this passage but do not have this verse. Okay, they have this part of the book of Acts, but they do not have this verse. So the preponderance of evidence suggests that, well, the King James has this lovely and liturgically valuable verse, and it is an ancient tradition that goes back to the time of perhaps even the second century, to the time of Irenaeus of Lyon. The, the, the reality is that there is no biblical warrant before the sixth or seventh century. So perhaps we need to at least bracket it or footnote and as the, King, as the New International and so many other translations.